Good morning, guys, and welcome to Five Steps to the Ultimate Business Plan. I'm excited to be with you this morning. Uh, feel free to wave or chat me up in the chat box there as we're going through the program. If you have a question, raise your hand. Happy to get them answered for you. But we're going to start by uh, jumping in right onto our outline this morning. Hopefully, you guys have downloaded this yourself along with the Four Schools Worksheet, which I'll also be covering today. Uh, so if you're here, I'm going to guess that I already know a few things about you. I know that you're motivated person. You're somebody that is wanting some self-improvement. You want to improve your career, your real estate career for sure. You're driven. You're somebody that's focused on uh, priorities. You want to make sure that you're setting yourself up for success. You're open to change and you're willing to work. So that's what I know about you just because you're with us this morning. Um, and if we're going to whiteboard, um, and I do this sometimes in a live class, if we're going to whiteboard out, what would it take for someone to be a super successful real estate broker, real estate agent? What would that look like if we whiteboarded it out? And a lot of times when I'm doing this live, people will say, well, they're a good listener. They're a hard worker. They're self-motivated. You know, they're task driven. They can manage their time well. They have, a, you know, just an overall great attitude. They're empathetic with their clients. Um, they're somebody that's a good listener. And then occasionally also get some skill based things, you know, they're good with technology or social media, but most of the time when you take in and add up the points on all these categories, what you find is that 80 to 90% of what makes a great real estate agent has everything to do with qualities and attitudes, rather than skill set. And that's really interesting. Some of us get kind of lost in the idea that we can't keep up or there's just no way for us to keep up with everything that's going on with technology and the changes in the marketplace. But most of that, believe it or not, doesn't matter at the end of the day. What does matter is your attitude about change and your attitude about the business because that's why people hire us. They hire us because they believe in us as people. And so starting with that kind of idea, we're going to move into what it's going to take for us to really grow our business in the next 12 months. So to grow your business over the next 12 months uh, starts with not necessarily business planning, but understanding that business growth starts with personal growth. And that's the first step before we start writing our business plan is to understand that your business image is often a reflection of your self-image. If you can't see yourself as a $20 million producer or a $50 million producer or as somebody that's running a team or somebody that has five or 10 or 20 listings in their inventory. If you can't see yourself as somebody that can carry five or 10 escrows at any given time or have a personal assistant, guess what? you won't do it. You've got to see yourself in that position. You've got to see yourself getting to that level in your business. Joyce Brothers had a great quote for this. She said, "To you can't perform at a level inconsistent with your self-image. You see, what happens for some of us, we've had great success maybe last year. Maybe we had a great month or a great week or a great year. And it's kind of like running and touching a hot burner. We touch it, we're like, oh, I could never do that again. That's like something that I can never see myself doing again. That was just a lucky break. I got a couple of lucky floor calls or I got a, a online lead and it just helped me get to this level that I could probably never touch again. You see, that is what happens when we don't see ourselves. We don't have that self image of someone who's performing at a higher level that we're at. All the business planning in the world won't solve that issue. What we've got to do first is accept that you deserve to win, that you're capable of winning, and that you can actually make this happen. So four things I want to talk to you just quickly about is, number one, embracing change. All growth requires change. And change sometimes can be a little bit painful and a little bit uncomfortable. If we always retreat back to what's comfortable, what's easy, we're always going to kind of get what we've always got because we're always doing what we've always done. We always get what we've always got because that's the rut. Remember, a rut is just a shallow grave. What we have to do is we have to grow. And it doesn't matter what level you're at, by the way. Somebody that, just as an example, as far as athletes, if you're an athlete that maybe runs five miles a day, you know, at first that could be challenging. But over the course of a few weeks and a couple months, pretty soon your body gets in tune with running that five miles and pretty soon it gets pretty easy. Pretty soon it's muscle memory just kicks in. Your body gets very efficient at running that five mile pace and you kind of just settle in to doing this and it just becomes very, very natural for you. But that's not growth. Once we get to that five mile pace, how do we push ourselves and do other things? For us in our real estate industry, we might be a, somebody that's been running at that five mile pace for a long time. It's just easy. It's comfortable. It's not get, making us stretch at all. And so we just fall into that same kind of mental trap. we got to stretch. we got to grow, push it to six miles, do some other kind of activity, some other kind of exercise so we can push ourselves beyond, right? My trainers tell me, my personal trainers, Jim, 
if you want to cash that check, you got to do the work, brother. And it ain't easy. It's going to be hard work to make your muscles really want to uh, grow. You've got to challenge them. You've got to do things that you've never done before. Second thing is we've got to build confidence. Confidence is so important in our industry and so many agents, uh, you can just read it all over them that they don't have confidence. And your clients can read that too. When they look at you and they can see a lack of confidence, what they're really reading is a lack of competence. You see, competence translates into confidence. If you know how to do something cold and you've done it lots and lots of times, guess what? You have high confidence. We all know how to ride a bike probably. We have high confidence in that. We know how to drive a car. We have high confidence in that, right? There's some things that you know how to do that you have high confidence in that no one can question. You're the ultimate expert in. That's where we want to get with our real estate business. And there's four things we want to get competence in so we can raise our confidence level. Here's what they are. You want to know your numbers in your marketplace. Know them cold. You want to be the expert, the preeminent expert in your marketplace. You want to know your systems, how you're running your business. And if you don't have systems, that's something we're going to talk about today. You want to know the tools that are available to you in the market. Simple things like the MLS and the, you know, the local county website and just the simple things that you need to know. You need to know them cold. You need to know them inside and out. And then you need to know your tech. There are some technology tools that you're going to need to know how to use in today's world, right? So four things that will help us build our confidence level. Fourth or third is we got to become a believer. And the first person we have to sell in real estate isn't the buyers and sellers out there. It's not our sphere of influence. It's ourselves. We have to sell ourselves on the fact that real estate, number one, is the best investment anyone can ever make. And it's the fastest path to wealth for everyone. And when we become believers, guess what? We are out there. We're evangelizing about the power and excitement of real estate. I'm a believer, right? I'm somebody that completely believes in this product. And you got to believe in your product. And we know that according to Harvard University, when you look at renters versus homeowners, uh, homeowners have 45 times more wealth than the average renter. The average renter has about $5,000 worth of wealth, right? The average homeowner is up on $230,000, $240,000 in wealth. And the reason for that is so many. Many uh, ways that we can help the people get into a house where they will use that as kind of a forced savings account, then equity grows, and there's so many benefits. Every time they make a payment, they're growing equity. All those things add up to building wealth over time, right? And then the other thing is you don't want to be the cobbler without any shoes on. I'm a big believer that every real estate agent should be investing in what they sell. No different than a stockbroker investing in stocks or a bond broker investing in bonds or somebody that sells gold, owning gold. We want to invest in what we sell, right? So I'm a big believer that every one of you should be buying at least one rental property a year. And one guy told me years ago, one of my mentors, he said, Jim, you know, the hardest way to make a million dollars in real estate. I said, what is it? He said, selling it. <laughs> I said, what's the easiest way? He said, owning it. So we sell real estate so that we can own real estate. And we're in such a unique advantage. So become a believer in what you sell. And then fourth is building a lifestyle plan. So lifestyle is so important and something I learned later in my career. I wish I would have learned it out of the gate, but many of us will get into the habit of building a business plan. And that business plan is great because it gives us clarity on what we need to do. But what we forget to do is to build a lifestyle plan. And really your lifestyle plan should be the driver of your business plan. In other words, I want to determine what I want my life to look like and my business should serve that vision. I want to know what time I want to get off. I want to know how many vacations I'm taking. I don't know how much time I'm spending with my kids. I want to know what kind of house I'm living in, what kind of car I'm driving in, what kind of lifestyle I'm enjoying from the fruits of my labor. Because if we're just hitting goals to hit goals, it's kind of meaningless, right? And it can take away from our overall lifestyle if we're not careful. There's a great statement of which, and a question, which is this, do you live to work or do you work to live? There's a big difference between the two, right? We don't want to be somebody that's just living to work because that's no fun. We want to work so we can live and really experience life. So business growth starts with personal growth. But I want to take you back to high school for a second. Back in high school, your high school physics teacher, or math teacher might have talked to you about Newton's laws, right? Do you remember what the third Newton law was? Here it is. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. That's Sir Isaac Newton said this. And what this really means is that if we want to achieve anything, especially with business planning, we must apply force to our business in order to have our business move in the direction we want it to go. So if we don't apply any force to our business, nothing happens. We got to put some force to 
our business. So things, we get some outcomes that we want. Force is the ultimate driver of our success, right? So some agents, unfortunately, are relying on outside forces uh, like the market or maybe lead generation systems like Realtor.com or Zillow.com or other third-party uh, systems to just drive their business. They're handing off their success to other third parties in hopes that those 30 parties will drive their business forward. They may or may not. We're starting to see those systems employed, employed in a lot of cases, but what a dangerous game to play when you're not taking control and you're not applying force in your own business. So the question I have for all of you guys now is what's driving your business today? Is it your intentional, predictable actions every single day? or are you market driven? So there's a difference. You're either market driven or strategy driven, right? Uh, and what that means is uh, when you're market driven, it's kind of like a high tide floats all boats kind of situation. We're in a frenzy market. So you, you can't sell your out of, you, you know, some agents can't sell their way out of a wet paper bag or still doing very well. You know, you kick over rock, three buyers uh, crawl out, you tie a uh, offer to a dog's neck and kick it in the butt. And two hours later, it comes back signed with an escalation clause. That's how busy our market is, right? That's going to result in uh, some agents doing well when they wouldn't do well in any other market. So that's a market uh, kind of tied helping these agents that would probably be unsuccessful otherwise. Or are we a strategy driven agent? Strategy driven agent means that we're successful and working a strategy regardless of market conditions. So remember this, predictable outcomes are driven by consistent, persistent, intentional actions. And we want to be strategy driven, not market driven. We don't want to be worrying about if the market's up, down, or sideways. We want to be more worried about our strategy within the market. Yes, market will affect us a little bit, but what we want to focus in on is what we're doing within each market. Because remember, you have a strategy right now. The question is, is it working? <laughs> and if you're not getting the level of success you want or the outcomes you want, then maybe it's not working at the level that you deserve. You see, there's something called dumb millionaires. And I don't know if you've ever heard this term, but a dumb millionaire is somebody you know. You know a dumb millionaire. There's somebody that just has found a system that's worked for them and they just keep doing it over and over and over and over again. And they've made a million dollars or more. I know a lot of people like that. And you're like, how are they doing so well? They're so dumb. They're dumb, but they're also brilliant. They're brilliant because they found a strategy that works for them. They found a system that works for them. That's not dumb. That's actually kind of brilliant. And we need to get around the fact that we all need to discover our own strategy. We need to develop our own strategy so that we can create success too. I would love to be and help a lot of people become dumb millionaires. But when we think about this, uh, we need to think about a quote from Dennis Watley. Dennis said this. He said, the reason most people never reach their goals is that they don't define them or ever seriously consider them as believable or achievable. Winners can tell you where they're going, what they plan to do along the way, and who will be sharing the adventure with them. That's Dennis Watley. So we definitely want to have an outline of what it is we're trying to get done. We want to have a written set of goals. But before we do that, there's one step that everybody misses. In coaching thousands of agents over many, many years, when we talk about uh, building goals, this first step uh, is really something that is the most often missed. Everybody focuses on the numbers, which we're going to get to in a minute, but we need to focus on why you're setting the goal to begin with. You see, a lot of us are goal setters. That's why you're attending this class. We're motivated to achieve. We're not afraid of hard work, and yet still, we often miss the mark, right? So some of us are goal setters, but we often miss the mark. Then you have other people that are agents who hit every goal they set for themselves. They're the overachievers, right? They hit every goal they set for themselves, but they're still kind of unhappy. Now, why would that happen? So you have two groups of people, people who set goals, but don't quite hit them. People that hit every goal, but aren't quite happy. What if I told you they're both, they both share the same problem? The same problem these two groups share is that they didn't have a defined why. They didn't have an overall driving purpose. You see a goal is a specific point of achievement. The overall driving purpose, in other words, your why, is why you have the goal in the first place. And a classic story, I have to tell you, is the story of Angie. Uh, she attended one of my career seminars. I used to do these every month for five years when I first launched my first company. And Angie came in and she sat down in the back of the room 
and attended this career seminar where we talked about the benefits of, of entering the real estate industry. At the end, uh, she came up and said, Jim, let me tell you my story. And I want you to tell me if I should get in the real estate industry. I said, okay, tell me your story. So she said, well, I just got divorced and my husband left me with three kids, three young kids, and he ran up all the credit cards uh, on his way out. And I'm a waitress and I'm kind of live, you know, paycheck to paycheck. Do you think I should get in the business? So I said, well, that's the question you're going to have to answer yourself, but I'll tell you the pros and cons. So I went through the pros and cons with her. At the end of the day, she called me a week later and she said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get in the industry. So she got in the industry, took her task, got licensed and came to work for me. Within 12 months, she sold ten and a half million dollars of real estate. Now, this is a classic example of somebody who not just had goals, but had a why. Her powerful overall driving purpose, her why was to feed those three kids and to pay off all that, all that debt that that husband had piled up, that ex-husband had piled up for her. Now, all of us, when we entered the business, had a why, but some of us have lost touch with it. And some of us need to create a new why because maybe we've accomplished the first why that we had. So I want you to think about that. Why are you in the business? Why are you going to get up at five in the morning or six in the morning and go for it? Why are you going to you know, stay late, come in early? Why are you going to refine your systems and your plan and work this hard if you don't have a why? You see, there's some top producers out there that just reset goals just over their last year's production. It's a very meaningless goal. Like if I say I did 10 million, but I want to do 12 this year. Yeah, but why? Why? Who cares? Why do you want to do 12 million? Just because you're competitive? Uh, I want to do 15 million. Why? What is your driving purpose? You have to have that. Yes, you can get motivated in short bursts based on numbers, but that's not going to last you. That's not going to keep you powered up at eight o'clock at night when you're negotiating a multiple offer sale. Trust me. You have to have that concentration, that ability to retouch that powerful why for yourself. So one thing you need to remember is that there's one of two reasons why you're going to stay motivated even after you get that why in place. And it's the difference between external motivations and internal mo motivations. If you look at great leaders, all great leaders, at some point during their lives, if I, I listen to a lot of autobiographies, I read a lot of autobiographies, and if you read through them, the all, almost all of them come to a pivot point in their life, a life altering decision point that they had to change. They had to turn a 180 in order to create this incredible success that they had. And how they get to that decision point is always very interesting. You see, we get to decision points in life based on one of two things, either external forces or internal forces. So external forces are people telling you you should do something. Internal forces are you telling yourself you should do something. And there's a big difference between the two. Um, and, you know, like external forces, somebody telling you, you should do this, you should do that, you should do this, you should do that. And you listen for a minute. But then you just sink back to what you used to do, right? I'm going to give you a classic example of this. Uh, my mother-in-law, Vicky. So Vicky, uh, a couple of years ago, um, she got sick, got very, very sick. And we took her to the hospital and they admitted her. And she was having a real bronchial problem, couldn't breathe, um, really terrible, terrible uh, problem breathing and felt really heavy on her chest. And uh, she had been a 50-year smoker. So they did an x-ray. They found a spot on her lung. And we thought, oh, this is it. This is the beginning of the end. You know, Vicky may not be with us much longer. So she thought too, we all thought she had cancer. Um, so luckily, about a week later, she uh, recovered and was doing fine. Turns out the, the spot on her lung was not cancer, but she was still in the hospital. And she said, that's it. I'm quitting smoking. It was too big of a scare for her. Uh, and so I said, well, Vicky, I bet you've said that before, haven't you? And she said, yeah, honestly, I have. And I said, well, you know, in order to make sure that um, we help, help you hit this goal, I want to... I want to help you with this. I'm going to give you what I call the carrot and the stick because the external forces in her life up until that point had all told, told her to quit smoking. And over, you know, 50 years, she had at times tried to quit smoking. Everybody telling her, quit smoking, quit smoking, quit smoking. But those external forces don't last long, right? The voices quiet down and you just return to your old behavior. What she needed is an internal voice, somebody inside of her that was motivating herself enough to stay the course, right? So using the carrot and the stick, Here's what we did. So the carrot was, I said, listen, name one thing you'd like to do that you've never done in your life. And she said, she thought about it for a minute. She said, I've never been to Hawaii. I'd love to go to Hawaii. I said, great. Um, if you are smoke free for 90 days, we'll all go to Hawaii together. How's that sound? She said, fantastic. Let's do that. I said, fantastic. I'm all for it. But I bet you've tried to quit smoking before and failed. She said, yes, I have. I said, so the carrot may not be enough. We need a stick. So the stick is, what would we have to get you to write a check for? If you, if you picked up a cigarette again, that would be, dissuade you from doing that. That would be enough of a penalty that you wouldn't do it. 
And she said, well, I said, well, she wouldn't give me a number. So I said, well, how about $500? You read Danielle, your daughter, a check for $500, my wife, a check for $500. Would that be enough? She said, no, if I was jonesing for a cigarette, I'd pay 500 bucks. I said, how about a thousand dollars? Mm, no, not a thousand dollars. Fifteen hundred dollars? No, it was twenty five hundred dollars. That was her number. Twenty five hundred dollars is how much of a penalty she needed in order not to smoke. So I said, okay, well, you're serious about this. Write a check for twenty five hundred dollars and give it to Danielle right now. In her hospital bed, she did this, handed it to Danielle. Danielle put it away, and Danielle is tough. And she said, now, mom, if you smoke. If I hear you smoking, if I catch you smoking, if I find out you're smoking, I'm cashing this check and I'm not accepting <laughs> any of your excuses. I'm cashing the check and we're going to go somewhere without you. So um, she did it. She wrote the check. And guess what? Of course, as you might expect, 90 days later, she smoked free. We did good, take her to Hawaii. And now two years later, she is still smoke free and never plans on smoking again. So that is the, the moral here is that she needed the internal forces and that carrot and stick helped her. And I want to point out the stick to a lot of you. Any of you that grew up poor, I grew up poor. We might be, uh, be blessed with the PSD designation, which is your poor, smart, and driven. That's a quote from Warren Buffett, by the way, who is the same way. And when you're poor, smart, and driven, sometimes carrots aren't enough because once you've achieved a certain level of success in your life, it no longer really matters that much, right? Another trip, another car, another house, who cares? But what you're more motivated by is what you'll lose if you don't perform at a high level. You're more motivated by not eating at a five-star restaurant. You're more motivated by you know, not being able to send your kids to college, or by not being able to buy the investment you want to buy, by not being able to retire at a certain age. Those are the sticks that motivate you. So you need to understand your carrot and your sticks and create a lane for yourself for, for, for performance that'll unlock your ability to move from mediocre to excellence because all of us have this ability to move from mediocre to excellence not next week not next month not next year like today today you can start acting as if you're already that 20 30 40 50 million dollar producer in your market you just got to commit 1000 percent to acting in excellence in every single thing you touch and that comes from those internal forces driving you to that level now we have seven laws of leadership that are super, super important when we're talking about designing your goals and really thinking about the next 12 months of your career. So number one is that you have to accept that you have to be a leader 100% of the time. So not only are you leading yourself, and I know some people will say, Jim, I don't lead a brokerage. I don't lead a team. I don't, what do you mean by that? And what I mean by that is you are still the leader. You're leading yourself, number one. You're also leading other people. You're leading buyers and sellers through the transactions. You're leading escrow officers. You're leading title people and uh, service providers and vendors. Everybody in your circle, you are the leader, right? And that means you're never more successful than your leadership abilities. Remember what I just said. You're never more successful than your leadership abilities. If you want to be better in business, be a better leader and start by leading yourself. Second is to show up and be focused. Now, whatever you focus on increases. Mature people grow, they change, they adapt, they pivot. And so we need to do the same. We've got to be growing and showing up and being focused, like intentional focus. Now, there's one way you can do that, by the way, is by reading more. And readers, you know, leaders are readers, as that old statement goes. Any of you that want to improve your lead, uh, reading skills, here's a great idea. Go to summary.com. Summary.com is a place where you can get cliff notes on all the best books. They can send them to you so you can read them quickly. You don't have to read all those books. You just read the cliff notes and make you look really smart. But you're also going to learn a lot of things by doing that, and it'll help you to show up and be focused. Next is to set goals and execute around priorities. Now, that sounds like such a simple statement I just said. Set goals and execute around priorities. That's the number one time management sentence ever written, written by the late, great Stephen Covey. If you just think about that, do I set goals and execute around priorities on a daily basis? If you just start doing that every single day, set goals and execute around priorities, and you use that as a mantra, that is your life's mission. Set goals and execute around priorities. I guarantee you, your ability to manage your time will dramatically change. Your ability to get tasks done will dramatically change. Your focus on what's truly important in your career and your life will dramatically change when you set goals and execute around priorities. Remember, if you're confused, so is everyone around you. So you need clarity. You need clarity on what needs to get done. Next is you got to control your emotions. Successful business leaders are not emotional in business. You can be as emotional as you want outside of business, but in business, 
we are running a ship that needs a captain at the helm who's not emotional. We're just like an attorney. We're like a doctor. We're like a surgeon. We have to be unemotionally unemotional when we're operating in and doing our business, right? And our business requires us to rise to a higher level where we're able to give trusted advice, trusted counsel, and operate without emotion. Whenever I see emotional agents, it shows me they're immature. The most strongest agents in our in our field, when you when you're talking to them, yeah, they're they're empathetic. They can talk at length with anybody for any length of time, but they're not emotional in the moment, right? Next is create and follow systems. So important. Leaders are, as we mentioned already, strategy driven, not market driven, which means they're following patterns and they're following systems. We need systems throughout our business. We need what we call in the military SOPs, a standard operating procedure. And when we adopt SOPs throughout our business, our business will not just flourish, it'll get easier. It'll get simpler and we'll be so much more efficient at what we do. And one of my good friends, uh, Neil Moffat, uh, Delta Ranger, uh, used to tell me all the time, he'd say, Jim, you can never be too efficient. And I always loved that. Ne you can never be too efficient. Next is to change rapidly when needed. Leaders know, leaders know how to spot trends early and act on those trends. So you should be watching the horizon, you know, watching the horizon and seeing what's coming, what should, what should I be ahead of, and try to get ahead on as many things as you can. With our coaching platform, what we do with our students is we try to get them ahead on early trends. We try to spot what's happening soon and get them on those paths early so they can win early in their markets. I'm a big believer in that. And then uh, surround yourself with leaders. You always surround yourself with leaders. Remember that you are the average of the five people you hang out with most. And when you're hanging out with losers, that means you're a loser. So to raise your game, it's not that you're being elitist, but you want to play golf with better golfers. That means your golf game will get better because you're surrounding yourself and you're modeling others. You look at uh, children. What do children do? They model the people that are around them. And when we want to get better, and some of us are like children in this industry, we want to model the best people in the industry. Now, let's jump into uh, goal setting. But before we do, here's a question for you. You're probably saying, Jim, but what about those first two laws. You talked about Newton's third law, right? But what are the first two? So the first two are an object at rest stays at rest. When you look around you in your real estate company, most of the agents and in the real estate industry, I should say, most agents aren't moving. They're not growing. They're not improving. They're complacent. They're apathetic and they're just straight up lazy, right? That's what most agents are. And that's where you get to that Newton's third law. An object at rest tends to stay at rest, right? But this is an opportunity for you to break away from the pack, right? Because the first law is this. The acceleration of an object is in direct proportion to the magnitude of force. The acceleration of an object is in direct magnitude, the acceleration of force. So if you want to go fast in your business, you've got to apply a lot of what? Force. A little bit of force creates a little bit of success. A mediocre amount produces a mediocre amount of success. A massive effort creates a massive level of success. Now, some cultures call this karma. Some call it the law of reciprocity, but it isn't mystical. It's not hypothetical. It's physics. It's science, and it applies to your real estate business. So what we're going to do now is we're going to jump in to actual goal setting, and we're going to be studying what I call force goals. So what are force goals? Well, force goals is an acronym for first, finding your numbers, operating as a business, reporting to peers, changing to grow, and then energizing your plan with max, massive action. So my belief is business planning shouldn't take, you know, hours of deep soul searching. I believe that you can get this done relatively rapidly. Maybe right now today while we're talking together, most of us know what we want. We just have to ask ourselves the right questions, right? So what we need to do really at the end of the day is make the commitment, not just to work in our business, but to also work on our business regularly. That's what is so, so important. So as we jump into this, let's start with the F part of this, which is finding uh, your numbers. Do you know where your next client is coming from? This is a litmus test, by the way. If I ask agents when I'm starting to coach them this question, do you know where your next client's coming from? This tells me instantly whether they're market driven or strategy driven. If you don't know where your next client's coming from, then you're truly a, a market driven agent. You're not strategy driven. When you look at the top agents in America, they by and large know where their next client's coming from. Uh, because they're running a strategy-driven business, uh, business. One of my good friends, Doug Morris, 
uh, who I've worked with for years, uh, back in um, 20, probably, I don't know, 2009, 2010, when I first recruited him to come to work for my company, in the, the, the depths of the Great Recession, he was still closing around $20 million in business. He was still number one in the market. Doug, when he brought him into the company today, he still works with us today. And now today he's doing like 60 or 70 million. Yes, the market impacted him, but here's the rule of thumb. When you look at market performers, they do well regardless of market conditions. In fact, if you look at the top 10 agents in a great market and the top 10 agents in a terrible market, they're usually the same top 10 agents. Why? Because they're not market driven. They're strategy driven and you need to be strategy driven as well. So what are the key numbers we need to look at? Well, we're going to walk through some right now. Number one, you want to understand what it is you need to do to hit your num numerical goals. You want to know how many closed sales you want to get to to hit your goals. And you want to break that down by listing-driven sales and buyer-driven sales. So I'm going to actually do something. I'm going to share our force goals worksheet with you. And this will help kind of walk you through some numbers. And I recommend you, you maybe want to get this out and check it out yourself. And so I'm going to grab this Excel spreadsheet here. Here's what it looks like. And so if you have this up, maybe on your screen as you're, as I'm walking through, or you can bring it up later after I'll show you how this works. So this spreadsheet will help you to figure out and find your numbers. Um, by the way, the bottom of this has tabs. So you see, find your numbers, operate like a business report to accountability partners, uh, your change calendar, energizing with massive action. Uh, so we're going to, as a starting point, go over here and we're going to put in an income goal. I'm going to say, 200,000. How about that? That's a reasonable goal. And the average commissions that I receive um, will say, you know, let's say it's $6,000 per commission. You know, I don't know what it is in your market, but let's just say agents on average taking home 6,000 uh, a transaction. This agent then would need to close 33 transactions in order to hit his or her goals. Now of that number, we need to decide how many of those transactions are gonna be listing driven versus buyer driven. I'm gonna assume that it's gonna be uh, say 16 listing driven and maybe 17 buyer driven uh, transactions. Now you're gonna notice it's already taken those numbers and plugged them in down here. So what it's saying is what percentage of the listings that I take sell? Now we used a number of 70%. In, in a normal market, that would be probably a pretty accurate number. Right now in the frenzy market, it might be more like 90% of listings sell, but I'm going to be, you know, a little bit conservative here and say 70% of listings you take will sell. Uh, that would mean in order to sell 16, I would need to take 23 listings over the course of a year or about two a month. There you go. It breaks it down by month. Same thing on the buyer side for all the buyers that we work with on average, usually close about 70%. A more experienced agent, maybe like 80 to 90%, but worst case scenarios, again, trying to close 17 transactions. That's again, I make that uh, 24 buyers I need to work with over the course of a year, about two a month. So they're basically doing one thing a week, either working with a buyer or seller in this case. So then we break this down and we say, okay, based on that, how many people do, would we need in our sphere of influence, which I'm going to cover in depth here in just a minute. For this agent, um, based on a 10 to one ratio, for every 10 people in his sphere of influence, we average one closed sale. He needs to have 333 people in his, his uh, database. But let's assume he's got some people in there already. Let's assume he's got like 156 people in there today. You'll notice it adjusts the numbers. Now he needs only 177 more to hit his overall goal. And I'll show you the logic behind that here in just a second, uh, which means he's going to add about one per day, less than one, but we can't do less than one human being. So we'll say one per day uh, over a 220 working day year. And then we know that for every 30 conversations we have on average, we'll average one closed sale. So he needs to have a thousand conversations over the course of 12 months. Sounds like a lot, but it's not. When you boil it down, that's five conversations a day. So now he knows his very specific targets of what he's trying to accomplish in order to hit his numerical goals by using that four goals worksheet. But let's drive deeper. Let's go further into this, guys. Because we have to ask ourselves, what is our most valuable asset? What is our most valuable asset in this industry? And the answer uh, for most of us is going to be our spheres of influence. That's our most valuable asset. In fact, I would challenge you to go back and look at the last 12 months of your closings and just make a note of how many of those transactions came from the result of your sphere of influence. I'm going to guess that most of your business came from your sphere of influence, maybe as much as 80 to 90%. That's the experience I have in coaching thousands of agents. So because of that, we need to understand the power of what I call Q2. That's the quality and quantity 
of your business. That's our key metric, the quantity and quality, not of your business, of your sphere of influence. Uh, that is the key metric in our business that's going to drive results. By far, most important thing that will drive results in your business is the quantity and quality of your database. Now, uh, every industry has a similar kind of metric that they work off of. For instance, Southwest Airlines has their chasm, which is their cost uh, per seat air mile. And everybody in the, in the system from the luggage handler all the way to the pilots knows that they're trying to drive that cost per air seat mile down so they all increase the profit because it's an employee-based company. That's their overall mission, right? For us, we need to understand what is our key metric. So when I ask coaching students, how many people do you have in your sphere of influence? What I love to hear them say is, oh, Jim, I know it's 232, it's 187, it's 286, it's 324. When they can tell me those numbers, that signals to me that they have complete control over the quantity and quality of their database. Uh, so why is quantity and quality so important? We're going to drive into that here in just a second, starting with building goals based on that. Now, you saw in our first force goals worksheet, we did just that. Now, we know just uh, statistically across the country with lots and lots of different trainers from Buffini and Tom Ferry and you know, my group and uh, the Ninja program and just tons and tons of other programs in the country, that it's kind of an accepted standard uh, that for every 10 people in your sphere, you'll average one closed sale. Um, so for an agent trying to close 30 transactions, for instance, that means that you would take your sold properties, 30 times 10 would get you to your number of how many people need to be in your database. In that case, it would be 300 people in your database. But you also have to be contacting these people regularly. You have to be contacting them 20 to 50 times a year. Now, that used to be 9 to 12 times a year but it's gone to 20 to 50 because there's so much more communication happening, so much more advertising happening in the world with social media and everything else that we have to, to break through. We got to be in front of them 20 to 50 different ways. Now it sounds like a lot, but remember we got social media, we've got text, we've got email, we've got direct mail, we got the phones, we've got Popeyes, we've got events, we've got all kinds of ways we can be in front of people. So that's a really, really good metric to look at is how many people do I need to have in my database to hit my goals? Another good metric, which you saw in the force goals, was another what I call measurable milestone is conversations. So with conversations, what you look at is um, the average number uh, that of conversations per transaction is 30. So if I want to close 30 transactions and I want to make that happen in within 12 months, that means I have to have 30 conversations per transaction. 30 then times 30 would be 900 conversations. Again, sounds like a lot, but when you divide it by the average working year of 220, it's really not that much. That would equal like four or five conversations per day. Very, very easily done for most people. But the key is consistency and knowing this number and being just dogmatic about it having that um, a commitment to mastering the mundane, not bailing on the trail, just powering through day in, day out, day in, day out. And when you do that, that's when you unlock results, right? Now, I want to go deeper, though. I want you to really master these numbers and make these numbers not just generalized, but unique to you and your business plan. So what I've done is I've created what I call my power base number. So the power base number is going to measure your specific uh, numbers for you personally. So here's how we do this. So I'm going to give you an example. Um, and you all should do this by printing out your last 12 months of transactions and then knowing how many people you have in your database, right? So you know your, how many people your quantity in your database. And then I'm going to know how many transactions came from referrals in my, by printing all my transactions from last year. And you're going to be able to do what John's doing here. So here's what John did. John sold 22 homes last year, okay? And had a database of 232 people. He can simply now divide his database, 232, by 22, the number of transactions that he had, the total number of sales, which equals 10.5. Now, he used the total number, which I recommend you do, by the way, not just fear, not just fear related sales. He just took his total number because what we're trying to do is we're trying to move our business to be mostly sphere-based business because it's a much easier um, business model to run. It's more profitable and your level of enjoyment with that business will be so much greater if you move your business that direction. So that's what John did. He took his total number of transactions divided by his total number of sphere members and he got 10.5. He's a little bit higher than the national average, but that's good because you want to make it realistic, right? So that means for every 10 and a half people in his database, he's averaging one closed sale. Now, how can he use that number and how can you use that number? Here's how you can use it. So you can reset your goals uh, using these numbers by measuring quantity and quality. Let's start with quantity. 
So if I say, if John says, hey, I did 23 transactions last year, I want to do 30 this year. Here's all I need to do. I take 30 closings times 10 and a half, which is his true power base number. It tells him that he needs to have 315 people in his database, right? By the end of the year. And it's not just a list of names. That's people he's contacting 20 to 50 times a year. So that's step one. Another way that he can get there is with the quality of his database. So let's assume he just keeps his database the same size, 232. And he has, and his goal is to try to help that database uh, create 30 closings, that means he needs to drive his power base number down to 7.7. .7. Now, how would he do that? He can increase his frequency of contact or the quality of his contact, maybe his messaging, how he's asking for referrals, how he's communicating. His quality could go up. That's one thing. But also the quality of his database could go up. And that's really what this is representing, the quality of his database. So instead of having maybe a lot of Cs or Ds that are under underperforming, not sending him a lot of business, He's replacing those people with that are much more likely to send him business, maybe more influencers, maybe people more connected to the community. So he's taking out some of the dregs and he's putting some new fresh people in that are much more likely to refer to him. So his overall database gets stronger. And that's part of having good database management. Super, super important to run a successful real estate career. So I like to use something called the 90 day rule to really supercharge results uh, for agents, because the biggest challenge agents have in this business is having gaps uh, in their business. And so here's what a gap is. A gap is people come to me and they say, Jim, I haven't closed a sale in 60 days or 90 days. And I'll say, okay, well, let's go backward for a second. And let's look at you, what you were doing 60 days or 90 days ago. If you weren't prospecting and lead generating consistently every single day, then you can always do this universally. You can go and say, if, when you don't prospect 90 days ago, you don't get paid 90 days from now. You don't prospect the 91st day, you don't get paid the 91st day. And you just go, you can go back and forth just like that. Those gaps in lead generation lead to gaps in closing performance. To eliminate closing performance gaps, you have to eliminate gaps in lead generation. So here's what you should apply, which is what I call the 4111 strategy, which is this. We have to commit to one hour of lead generation every single day, uninterrupted, one hour lead generation. You pick the time, but it's got to be calendared, put it on your calendar. Second is with that one hour lead generation, we're going to be setting a appointment with either a buyer, a seller, or somebody in our sphere where we're doing a networking meeting. Any of those three are great. So we're setting one appointment. And because we're setting one every day, we're going on one every day with a buyer, seller, or somebody in our sphere. And then the fourth thing we need to do every day is we need to add one person a day to our sphere of influence. But let's park there for a second. By adding one person a day to our sphere of influence over a 220 working day year, we're adding 220 people a day, I mean, a, a year to our database, which on a 10 to one a, uh, average equals 22 transactions a year right there alone, right? Now, when we think about that though, uh, it's about consistency. The average American uh, has 27 conversations a day, 27. All we have to do out of one of those conversations that we on average have a day is to funnel that conversation into a, a conversation where I get permission from that person to add them to my database. So easy to do when we get hyper-conscious of it. And we realize the power of what happens when we add people to our database. Remember the lifetime value of a client. Lifetime value of a client on average, according to Inman News, is $100,000 in real estate. So every time you add somebody to your database who eventually becomes your client, you're adding $100,000 to your bottom line over, the, over your real estate career. So that's where it becomes very, very meaningful. So next is the five steps to scalability. For those of you that um, haven't done a great job with your sphere and you also are adding another pipeline to your business, which I recommend to everybody, is the first things you do in prospecting that one hour every day is your sphere, then follow up, then your other pipeline. All of us should have a, another pipeline, another leg of driving some people into your business. And so what this might look for us like is it could be for sale by owners. It could be for rent by owners. It could be absentee owners. It could be um, working with people that are investors or relocation clients. There's so many other different pipelines out there. But when you look at the five steps to scalability, uh, once you've identified that pipeline, by the way, with our coaching program uh, over at The Path and E-Real Estate Coach, we have built for you 16 
weeks of lead generation coaching. And when I say 16 weeks, I mean every single day for 16 weeks, we're immersing you in hundreds of different techniques for lead generating in your real estate business. Um, it is unlike anything you've ever seen, and it's the most affordable coaching program in the country. But when you're in that, you have this opportunity to find one coaching, I mean, one coaching, one pipeline that's going to work for you. Believe me, you're going to find more than one, but let's assume you find one. And let's just say it was for sale banner, just for example. I choose my pipeline, then I master it. I master it by learning the scripts, by building the, the drip systems, so by building out every aspect of it. So it's mastered. I own this area and I really, really get on top of it. I'm not somebody that's going to flitter around and do one thing for five minutes, another thing for five minutes, another thing for five minutes. I'm going to master one area. So I master this pipeline. Then I codify the process. And what that means is I create a written code around it, right? So that it's, uh, I have step A, step B, step C, step D. Now, why do I do a written code? Because I want to automate the system. I want to use as much technology as possible, but I also want to be able to automate it to the sense that I can hand it off to someone else if I want to scale my business. And then they can work with that code. They just look at the code and they go, this is all I need to do. I just got to just start doing this. And I, I've already created the system. They just got to follow the pattern, right? And then I can replicate and accelerate that. So I can just go faster and faster and faster. I might be able to add more team members and we can do it faster and faster and faster and faster and faster so that I can scale and scale and scale and scale. That's the five steps to scalability. But now we're going to move over to operating as a business. So here's a question. Why do 80% of all businesses fail yet only 5% of franchises fail? It's a great question. I actually heard this question for the first time from Michael Gerber in the book, The E-Myth Revisited. If you haven't read that book, it's a great book about systemizing and creating a business that's actually saleable um, and not just in real estate, but in all businesses. And when he posed that question, it's an interesting question. And the answer to that question is that the systems that these franchises are selling are the key to their success. So the franchise is selling a system. It's selling an A through Z way to operate a business. No one has to rethink it. In fact, you're required not to rethink it. You're required to attend training so you specifically follow the pattern that's been set out that they've proven to work, right? And that's what we need to do is we need to adopt uh, systems and operate like a business. Now, I want to take a sec and I'm going to jump back over to our four goals worksheet for a second and show you what we can do to really start operating more like a business uh, in our real estate careers. So I'm going to share my screen again. And we are going to hop right back over here to our four schools, which you guys all have. So now I'm going to, I'm going to hit the bottom tab to, to operate like a business. And it's going to give me a whole checklist of things I could be doing to operate like a business. And we're going to, we're going to touch on a few of these as we move back through the, the outline. But one of them is creating a job description, which I'm going to talk to you about here in just a second. Another one are some, these are some like logistical things that every one of us should be doing creating a business entity like an S Corp or an LLC, meeting with an attorney or an accountant, uh, creating a business budget and defining a marketing and tech budget, uh, depositing commissions into a business account, not your personal account, paying yourself a set wage and building a reserve of six months of income, hiring a bookkeeper to manage finances and track deductions, paying taxes quarterly, securing life insurance and health insurance for your family, creating a retirement plan. You're going to see you can set deadlines for yourself and have a check mark when these things are done. Uh, time management, begin working only by appointment, schedule all major holidays off, use reoccurring appointments for important items, lead generation, sphere, marketing, so forth, power hours, creating a sphere of influence management plan, building a lead conversion process, building a follow-up process, building an active buyer uh, process on flowchart. See all these systems and it goes on and on and on down here. And the idea here is you're trying to start to think about yourself as operating as a business, operating at a higher level than you're operating at now. So important to really growing and uh, moving up to where you should be operating like. Now, coming back over here, um, so we know that we should be modeling what uh, smart businesses do, which is create systems, but how do you do it, right? So um, I'll give you a classic example myself personally. When I uh, came down and um, started working here at the company that I work with now, uh, the first year I got here, we did about $100 million in sales. Um, and we've now grown that to just about a billion dollars in sales over 10 years. And we have not grown our staff by 10 times, which that's like 10 times the volume, but we don't have 10 times the staff. What we've done is we've become much more efficient. And one of the ways we've become much more efficient is we've created what we call knowledge books. 
Every staff member has a knowledge book at their desk, which defines their job function and all employees are cross trained. By the way, I do a lot of brokerage coaching where we talk about recruiting and retention and building systems and profitability in your business. And one of the things we talk about is this book of knowledge and the importance of having everybody cross trained in the business, having no fiefdoms, everybody can do everybody's job. So the escrow person can do listings, listings can do escrows, escrow and listings can run the front desk, right? Everybody knows how to do everybody else's job. It's so important. And when we look at that, you might say, okay, well, how does that book of knowledge work? Well, what we do is we take one area. And if you apply this to your real estate business, we can look at this as maybe it's follow up with buyers. Maybe it's follow up with sellers. Maybe it's the first meeting with the seller, the first meeting with the buyer. So you take one slice, look at your, your career as a, a loaf of bread. You slice it up. You take one slice. That's one area you're going to codify. So let's say it's follow up with buyers. And now I'm going to say, well, if I'm going to start following up with buyers, I'm going to move to a level of excellence with this. What would that look like? Well, I'm probably going to want to connect with them on social media, right? I'm going to want to send them a thank you card. I'm going to want to put them on a drip system. I'm going to want to send them uh, some good, solid marketing statistics. I want to do a buyer CMA for them on any home that they're interested in. I'm going to create a whole system, a follow-up system for all buyers. But what I do is I codify that. And I write out every single thing. It could be two or three pages. And then I codify it into one page so that it's simple. So I, I simplify it into one page. Then I read the code every time I start the process anew with the next buyer that comes into my contact with. And I go, like, okay, okay, what am I supposed to do? And I can even turn this into a checklist. Did I do this, 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 and this? And I examine it and I look for ways we can improve it. So over time, the process gets better and better and better and better. So I get more and more and more efficient. And that's the ultimate goal. Now, we also can do something else for ourselves to take ourselves to a higher level, which is creating a job description for ourselves. You want to operate like a business, we should have a job description for the one employee, for most of us, the one and only employee we have, which is ourselves. So what I mean by that, is imagine, I'm going to put you in the perspective of an employer for a second. Imagine that you hired somebody and you're going to pay them double what you're making or triple or quadruple. Let's say you're going to pay them three or $400,000 a year. And because you're hiring this person, you got to write them checks. What, here's my question is when you're paying that person that kind of money, what would be your expectations? Would you expect that they come into the office at 8 a.m.? Would you expect they have a listing presentation? Would you expect that they use CRM? Would you expect they use a follow-up system? Would you expect that they really be good at social media? Would you expect that they um, have really good communication skills? Would you expect that they use text? And would you expect that they are, are comfortable in front of a camera and do video? You probably would have all those expectations and a lot, lot more, right? But how many of you don't have that same expectation of yourself, yet you want to be paid four or five or $600,000 a year? If you don't have at that level of expectation for yourself, first of all, you should have it. And secondly, you need to operate as if you are that employee and start living up to that level of expectation. So start with that process, write down a job description for your job, and then treat yourself as the one employee you have. Because if you don't do this, what you can often do is fire yourself. Here's what happens with a lot of agents. They fire themselves. You know why they fire themselves? Is because they don't know how to manage themselves. And so what they do is they say, I can't manage myself, so I'm going to fire myself and go to work for somebody else who can manage me more effectively and tell me what to do every day because I can't tell myself what to do. This one page job description will help you to tell yourself what to do. It's a good idea to reflect on it and look at it every week, add to it and really get in tune with it because it can really power you up. Now, moving over to the R part of this, which is reporting to accountability partners. Uh, something I discovered a few years ago had a profound effect on me is how I work and how I train others. It's called the Hawthorne effect. You see what I discovered and what scientists have actually discovered is that when people are observed, they perform at a higher level. And how this was discovered was uh, Western Electric's uh, factory at Hawthorne, which was a suburb of Chicago in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, what they did is they decided they were going to come in and change the lighting in the factory and change the, like, the ergonomics, how the factory was laid out and see if they could improve employee performance. So they did that. And then they had come in, people come in and watch the employees and see if it helped. And what they found was it wasn't the lighting or the ergonomics that had changed anything. What really had changed was that these employees were now being watched. And when they were being watched, their performance, their output actually dramatically increased. So it was the act of the, of the viewer, the person watching that increased productivity. And I actually experienced this myself. I, 
uh, grew a real estate company. I got in the business when I was young at 23, opened my first company, grew that to 17 offices, and I sold that in 06. Uh, but what happened after that is I spoke for a few years for, for the National Association of Realtors, wrote a few books, but then I got recruited to come down and run a, a company down here in Southern Oregon, which I'm still down here doing today. But when I came down here, I went to work for somebody as an employee, first time I'd ever done that in my life. And when I did, I experienced the Hawthorne effect. I worked harder for that person than I ever worked for myself because I was being watched and because I didn't have the luxury of not performing at a high level when I know it should be. So it pushed me to a higher level, which can we can actually rise to this level by um, using some really simple techniques in our own market. One is to have peer partners. I think having a great idea is to to create an accountability group within your own company where you have four or five of you guys meeting every week and you talk about your goals for the week and what you want to accomplish and then hold yourselves accountable the next week when you come in talk about what he actually got done and how did that match up with what you're trying to do and what are you going to try to do next week to improve everybody brings an idea that's a peer-to-peer -peer group you could take it all the way down to a one-on-one -on -one peer group but i find that small groups are better than the one-on-one -on -one and in often in cases in offices where i've coached so Another idea is to adopt a board of directors approach, which I think you could do hand in hand. You could have the peer group in your office, but you could also have a board of directors. And really all public companies have a board of directors. These are people that the company answers to. And many successful entrepreneurs do the same thing, but it's more of an advisory board. So where I learned this concept in terms of using this with entrepreneurs, I learned it from Jack Canfield. I attended the NAR convention and Jack was speaking and he talked about his life and his background. By the way, for those of you that don't know who Jack Canfield is, he wrote the book, The Chicken Soup, Soul, uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul series. Uh, side note, that book was rejected by 130 publishers before it got published. It now has sold 112 million copies worldwide, one of the best selling books of all time. Uh, wouldn't you hate to be one of the 129 that rejected him? <laughs> kind of interesting. Um, but what fortitude to go out there and keep pushing when you get to the, the 100th rejection, the 101st rejection, the 102nd rejection, 121st rejection, 125th rejection, and you still push through and get to the 130th rejection. And then your life changes by becoming the best selling author really in history uh, from that time. So Jack taught this lesson about the, the power of, board, of having a board of directors. And one of the reasons he's so successful is what he said is that he, you know, does really, really well in his business, obviously making 20, $30 million a year in speaking fees and all kinds of events that he does. But he surrounds himself with a board of directors who's much more successful than him. And so he's going and talking to people that are doing 100 million, 80 million, 90 million, 200 million dollars uh, in business. And he's getting his advice from them. Think of ourselves. There's people in our community, whether they're in real estate or not, who could be on our board of directors, who could give us some advice and some counsel that would have a dramatic impact on our business. All we gotta do is ask the question. It could be as simple as this. Hey, I'm looking for someone to give me some informal advice on my business strategy from time to time. You've been incredibly successful. I really admire what you've accomplished. Would you be open to give me some suggestions a couple of times a year? Promise not to waste your time and come prepared. Most people, when they get that request, are gonna say yes. And here's the benefit. When they say yes, and you follow up and you have this meeting, guess what's gonna happen? They're going to adopt you in some cases, <laughs> in most cases, I'm going to say, and you're going to become a special project for them. And they are going to be your biggest advocate, your biggest cheerleader. They're going to make introductions for you. You wouldn't have made otherwise. And they are going to put you in touch with the movers and shakers in the community. And they're going to refer a lot of business to you. So it's a win, win, win all the way around. Very, very, very powerful strategy. Next, we're going to talk about change. The C part of this. So change inspires growth. There's something called um, the million dollar test I like to use with agents. So my test in your market, it might be $5 million. So the test is this. If somebody called you and said, I have a $5 million property I'd like to list with you right now, but you got to be over here in the next 10 minutes. Are you prepared to be on that person's doorstep in 10 minutes? Assuming you can get there in 10 minutes, taking out travel time, 10 minutes. Can you get there? Can you take that listing? First of all, that's going to ask, are you dressed for the part? Do you look good? Are you shaven? Do you have makeup on? Do you look like somebody that is ready for that appointment, right? Do you come in prepared? Are you prepared every day for opportunity? Is your listing presentation dialed in? Do you have a pre-listing kit, right? Are you dialed in? Do you have a success portfolio? Are you dialed in? And the reason I ask for this is because we have to be ready and open for opportunity all the time. The agents that aren't as successful as they should be are the ones that are closed to opportunity. They're not looking for opportunity because they're assuming the worst every single day. 
When we come to work every day expecting the best, expecting success, expecting opportunities to come to us, guess what happens? Opportunities come to us. And I see it so often with new agents in, in this business. New agents expect success and they get it. They get listings and they get sales. I call it the new agent phenomenon because they expect to get it, right? They haven't, been, they haven't been hit over the head by the market or things in the market which have told them they can't do it or won't work, it's not gonna happen like some veteran agents. Instead, they're coming in bright-eyed and bushy-tailed every day. You need to have that same approach. And why do I say this? Well, for the obvious, you wanna be ready for opportunity, but also there's something called heuristics and the halo effect. Uh, there's a Nobel Prize winning author and psychologist, Daniel Kahneman, and he believes the answer to why people judge us based on how we look is something called heuristics. And what heuristics is, is the mental shortcuts that the brain makes to deal with making decisions really rapidly. He believes that the brain makes decisions based on instantaneous uh, review of what's called known knowns. So when somebody looks at you, they're looking at what they know. They don't know you as a person. They just look at known knowns. They know that I'm dressed well. They know that I'm clean shaven. They know that I look put together. And so based on those known knowns, they make a quick snap decision. Do I trust this person? Do I not trust this person? Do I give this person respect? Do I not give this person respect? Should I listen to this person? Should I not listen to this person? And guess what's interesting about this? When you study this phenomenon, our brain's ability to deal with known knowns within tenths of a second is actually extremely, extremely, extremely accurate. And it actually gets it right most of the time. Can it be fooled? Yes, of course. But we get something when we dress the part that's called the halo effect. When we dress the part, the halo effect, just like it sounds, means that people make assumptions based on how we're dressed, that when we're dressed successful, that we are successful, right? That when we're put together, that we're put together people, right? When we come across that way, we've all experienced it. We've all experienced it at a restaurant. When we're dressed up, we get better service at a hotel, you know, wherever we're at. We're at a concert. We get better service when we're dressed better. It's just a matter of fact. So the question mark is, what can I do to meet that million dollar test? Can I, can I look better? Can I come prepared for more opportunity every day? Do I have everything in my business dialed in ready for opportunity? If the answer is yes, that's great. But we can also move up to other levels in our business, other levels of the million dollar test. So I'm gonna actually um, hop over and we're gonna go back into for just a second um, the four schools worksheet to show you some other areas where we can get better and we can improve. So let's uh, jump in here for a second. Here it is, the four skulls worksheet. And we have something here called the change calendar. So, you know, looking the parts one thing, but also other areas of your business, which you can improve. I call this having a change uh, calendar. So the change calendar whoops, uh, looks like this. And so this is like, improving aspects of your business every single week and every single month. So the change calendar is just having an idea of we need to improve every aspect of our business ongoing and working, not just uh, in our business, but on our business. So for instance, in January, maybe I could focus on buyer presentations. And what I would recommend people do is schedule like Thursdays, maybe from 10 to noon, two hour block where they just work on their buyer presentation. Imagine doing that two hours a week for four weeks that's eight hours in a month where you dial in your buyer presentation. Do you think you would have a 10,000% increase in your uh, ability to present to buyers based on working eight hours with your buyer presentation? You would be so much better and you would close so many buyers and you would have such a better experience with buyers if you did that, right? And then you do the same thing in February. You, you maybe work on follow-up systems. In March, website enhancement. In uh, April, relocation packages. In May, CRM system. In June, the social media strategies. In July, transaction management. And on and on and on and on. And what you do is as you work through these, you just check it, done. I did it, done, done, done. You're just getting better and better at every aspect of your business. Remember, if you can get 1%, 5%, 10% better in your business every single month, that's gonna be an exponential increase in how well you're performing over the course of a year. You can be beating every experienced agent in your market that's been in the business 10, 20 years because they're not keeping up. You're keeping up, you're dialing in because you're focused on working on your business. I love the change calendar. So that's another way of getting better. There's an old story about Miller Beer really quickly. Remember Miller Beer? And they had this story about uh, they had the ads that were less filling, taste great, less filling, taste great. The ex NFL stars and coaches would be arguing in the, in the bar. 
And that did really well. They sold a ton of beer and they kept running that ad and running that ad and they kept selling more beer and more beer until finally it got stale and the sales of beer started to fall, but they kept running the ad and sales of beer fell more and they kept running the ad and sales of beer fell even further. And they kept running the ad thinking that if they just spent more, they just turned to different coaches and different athletes that it would continue to work. Guess what? It stopped working. Some of you are the Miller beer of real estate right now. You are working um, strategies, you're working systems that are old, they're failed, they no longer work, and you've got to change. You've got to grow and you got to stretch, right? Super important for you to not get trapped in using the old systems that uh, are not producing high levels of, of success anymore. So moving forward, we're going to get into um, the last part of this, which is energizing the plan with massive action energizing the plan with massive action. So this is really where the rubber hits the road. We take our goals set and we know what we're supposed to be doing, right? We know that we are supposed to be uh, spending an hour in lead generation, adding people to our sphere of influence, having conversations every day. We know we're supposed to be, you know, organizing our business and creating a change calendar and uh, really having accountability built into our business. But what are we doing on a daily basis? This is where we have to have a daily action plan a very, very specific level of actions that we're gonna be taking that's not a mystery, that is very specific. And not just, I'm gonna prospect for an hour, but here's what I'm gonna do during that hour. I'm going to be calling X number of people. I'm gonna be focused on this pipeline. I'm gonna be doing this, that, and the other with numbers attached to it so that it's not a vague statement. It has to be very specific and it's a daily action plan. I'm gonna be working within proven techniques. I'm not you know, chasing you know, secret magic potions and secret bullets and, you know, all these things that people throw at you and you're seeing on Facebook and, oh, buy this, that, and the other. Don't do it. Stick with proven systems. That's one thing with our coaching platform. When you see our systems, these are coming from the top producers in the country. These are time-tested, market-proven techniques that drive results. Then you want to use systems that are scalable and repeatable, and you're measuring yourself on a daily basis. I'm going to show you a tool to do that in here in just a second, by the way. And you're going to be improving the systems regularly and you're adapting to the market in real time. You're pivoting as the market's changing and you're just, you're pushing a lot of energy through your, uh, through your engine and you're just getting yourself uh, ramped up for the business. So I'm going to give you specific strategies and tactical uh, things that you could be doing in 2021 to really grow your business. Um, we've been focusing with my coaching students um, on a lot of different areas. I'm just going to give you the top four here. Uh, one is urban flight. So we know that people are moving out of cities, out of metro markets, and they're moving to the rural markets and suburban markets. Because of this, this creates massive opportunities for those of you that position yourself around a magic word I'm going to share with you in just a second. And then investor marketing. There's eviction moratoriums happening across the country. Rent controls are happening across the country. Uh, rates of return are falling. Rents are falling. And so people that own these properties are looking for exits. And this is a great opportunity for more listings. Move up sellers. This is the greatest time in history for a seller to move from their current home where they may be paying 3.73 or 4% interest into their dream home where they could pay 2.75% or less interest and maybe have very little, if any, change in their payment because of how much more buying power they have. No one's talking about buying power. Buying power is essential. It's something we should be talking about. And then education marketing. I'm so excited about this concept. We want to be attracting business like a magnet to us. And how do you attract business? You wanna be the trusted advisor, somebody people can turn to, and some people, some, some ones people learn from uh, when they need real estate information. So being an educator uh, can really turn you into somebody that is uh, respected in your own market and somebody that people are really looking for, for guidance. And so education marketing is so big and we are really tuned into that with my students. So I'm going to dive deep into urban flight and investor marketing for just a couple of minutes. So here's a statistic from uh, NAR, 8.9 million people relocated since the beginning of the pandemic. Most people of those that group moved relatively close within about 60 miles of where they came from, but they're moving in by and large, according to the United States Postal Service, out of large cities, and they're moving into suburbs or rural markets. And because of that, that drives this magic word relocation. We want to focus our 
um, some of our efforts this year on the word relocation. We want to be a global realtor, not just a local realtor. We want to be somebody people turn to when they're relocating anywhere in the country, right? So we want to build relocation into your website. You want to have videos of your market area, demographics about your market area, economics about your market area, real estate trends, things to do, local favorites, links to chamber and social data, school data. You want to have every piece of data that you would want if you were moving to the area. Also, the key thing here, guys, video, video, video. You need to have a YouTube channel that's focused on the hyper-local market. Having that video will put you far and away above your nearest competitor because people are looking for videos about the local market, and that will differentiate you. Remember, if you just do one video a week, over 52 weeks, you'll have 52 videos. And if you do them in the right way, they can be evergreen and used forever. And they can be used for so many things, your website, social media, drip campaigns, as emails, so many uses for video. Then adding relocation specialist to your bio on Zillow, Realtor.com, your Yelp profile, all your social profiles should include the words relocation specialist. You also want to think about farming realtors. Farm realtors in these communities around where you live. And think about this. If you're farming realtors, you treat it just like any other kind of demographic farm. You're reaching out to them through phone, email, social media, direct mail, and you're positioning yourself as the go-to person for your market area, but you're offering them an, an, you know, an enhanced re, uh, referral fee, maybe 30%, 31.5%, something odd, but also they'll remember it. And then you're guaranteeing them payment and you're guaranteeing that you'll stay in contact with them every week till closing. They're going to they're gonna come to you. They're going to come to you in droves, but you got to be out there farming them. And next is targeting HR directors. These are people that work at companies in your community that uh, have 25 employees or more where there's an HR director where they're going to be trying to recruit employees and you can be somebody that steps alongside them and it helps sell the community. They sell the company, you sell the community. You just got to position yourself and have some conversations with these HR directors and then just identifying where the feeder markets are. Now, good news is the uh, NAR just did a whole study for us about this and the, the link is here. I'll send it on to you. It's um, showing where people are moving to and from. So for instance, I did Washington State here. And in Washington State, 60% uh, of people are moving, uh, they're leaving the state and going to Idaho, 60%. So if I'm a smart marketer and I have a farm area or my sphere of influence, I can say, who do you know that's moving to Idaho? Who do you know that's talked about moving to Idaho? You think that get attention? Yes, because that's where most people are moving, right? And uh, next is Arizona, California, Oregon, and Oklahoma. Oklahoma is an outlier. That's way away. That's kind of interesting. And then um, Washington over here is who is moving into the state? People from Idaho. That's like they're trading places here. Texas, Oregon, California, New York. So you could also do marketing in Idaho and say, thinking about moving to Washington, contact me. By the way, if I'm farming realtors, I'm farming realtors in Idaho because I know a lot of those people are coming to Washington if I'm a Washington realtor. You see the power of this, guys? So powerful. Next, really quickly, the deep dive on this on investor marketing is uh, because of eviction moratoriums, rent controls, court closures, ROIs decreasing, these people are much more likely to sell than they've ever been before. Uh, this is an example of a letter one of my students received um, that owns a property in Carlsbad, California. So it, it says, a rental property, by the way, it says California, this is a realtor sending it to her. California continues to reach in the pockets of rental owners um, by restraining them from collecting rents and evicting non-paying tenants. Unfortunately, that's the tip of the iceberg. Tenants can now operate childcare businesses in homes they rent with up to 14 children. No evictions allowed till February 1st. More taxes, stronger rent controls, more tenant protections on the way. That get your attention? I got mine. And then it goes on and on. They've got some great techniques in this letter. These are the kinds of things we're sharing with our coaching students every single day to help them win in their markets and help keep them on the cutting edge of uh, staying on top of different new target markets that are emerging all the time. Here's a couple of texts that we've recommended for our students uh, where they can text their own sphere of influence to encourage them to get into the investor side of the market. So you could say several investments coming to market now for investors and flippers. Let me know if you know of anyone looking for an amazing deal. Everybody wants to be a flipper, right? Another one is ever thought about buying an investment property? If you have been looking to time the market, this is a great time. And another one is, hey, if you know of anyone that needs to sell fast, I have some investors that are in the market for some projects. Great text to send your sphere. 
and this to reach out to Sphere, uh, not Sphere, but investors that may be advertising their own properties on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist or someplace like that, you could say, hey, I was just calling about the rental property in Facebook Marketplace. Just quick question, have you rented the property yet? Yes or no? I say, my name is Jim Remley. I'm with ABC Real Estate. Can I just ask you a quick question? How long have you owned these units? Oh, five years. Oh, can I ask you, how do you feel about the no eviction rules that have been put into place? And they're going to go off. Ah, ah, I hate it. <laughs> I got a crazy question for you. Because of these rules, I'm hearing a lot of people that are maybe considering selling. Would you consider selling these units for the right price? Because I've got a lot of buyers in the market that are looking for homes or looking for investment properties. That script is killing right now and crushing. So lots of ideas for growing your business. And really, this all boils down to um, is growth, right? And really having a daily action plan. Whatever your action plan is, whether it's investors, absentee owners, find your plan and work your plan. Now, I'm going to leave you with some tech ideas um, really quickly. Uh, for 2021, the things you got to get control of, your CRM. Got to have control of your CRM. Text management, or excuse me, text marketing. This is the, this is the next wave, guys. Text marketing, 90% of people respond to texts. Uh, it's not that we stop doing me everything else. We still do emails. We still do phone calls. We still do, you know, direct mail. But text marketing is where it's at in 2021, right alongside video marketing and social media marketing. All those, those three, that's like a trifecta: text marketing, video marketing, social media marketing. That's a big priority for getting your hands around. And if you can't do it, hire somebody you can in your office. Um, website to check out for those of you that want to focus on text marketing is community.com. It's a really, uh, really cool site on how to build a community that you can, um, you're so, basically your sphere of influence and you communicate through text. Uh, super high engagement rates, really cool. That's uh, community.com. Another one's easytexting.com. And then um, something else really quickly for those of you that haven't got on the video bandwagon. I know a few of you are using BombBomb, which is great. I love BombBomb. But there's another system out there called Loom, L-O-O-M.com, which I love. Very simple to use, very user-friendly, and very fast to record things and capture uh, content on your screen. Makes it super simple to do so. Two easy, easy programs to use. So if you like what I'm saying and you're like, this is like the kind of stuff I need to hear all the time. I'd love to share with you for just a few minutes what we're doing with our coaching platform. Uh, and let me just share my screen with you. And by the way, for those of you that want to connect with me that haven't yet on any platform, you can just look us up on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and look up uh, e Real Estate Coach. You'll find us in those locations. Uh, but for those of you that are interested in uh, the most affordable coaching platform in the country, I think has the most value in the country. Um, it, we have one called The Path, and it's at erealestatecoach.com. So I'm going to just take you on a three-minute walkthrough of what our coaching platform looks like, because I think it can really be transformative for you, for you that are watching and that really want to do something special with your business. So when you become a member of The Path, uh, you click over here and you go over to your personal portal. There's a lot of courses in here, but uh, you're going to be looking for the path. By the way, when you become a member of the path, you receive every single product that we've ever made is included in the path portal. Never have to buy another thing. Every single coaching product that we've ever built goes into the system and every one we will ever build will go into the path first. Um, and we're building new stuff all the time. So the path uh, performance coaching platform, the foundation of it, is a 16 week um, lead generation uh, system. And so it is a coaching program. Like think of it like a boot camp, kind of the Netflix of coaching, 16 straight weeks of coaching every single day for 16 weeks to get you on top and dialed in with lead generation. We want to remove you being a market driven agent. We want you to become that strategy driven agent. And we've done it in a really fun, easy format. So it's broken into four steps over four weeks. And so each step is really simple. You go to start with step one, obviously. And when you're in step one, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to click on the, you know, step one, week one, I would be clicking on the success cycle, just as an example. And all of these are short. They're designed so you can have your coffee, right? Got your coffee. And you watch it in the morning while you're drinking coffee, five, 10 minutes. It's going to start your day off right. Don't watch negative news. Don't watch, you know, your social media. that's going to drag you down. Get yourself into mindset of winning for the day, like win the day early, five, 10 minutes of coaching. And it's all going to be really activity-based. 
I drive right to the point. It's not going to be a lot of fluff. It's going to be very nuts and bolts kind of coaching on what you can be doing for the day to really drive business into your, in, into your pipeline. So as you're watching each step, uh, what we do is we give you the downloads that I'm talking about. So if I'm talking about a script, an email, uh, talking about a social media post, I'm talking about a letter, an objection handler, a system, a form, a presentation, whatever it is, you can download it right then and there instantaneously and be using it in your market within two minutes. It's all plug and play material. Then you can also ask me questions uh, in the system. So if you have a question, I'll answer on the fly right then and there. Uh, so the maximum time it'll take is 24 hours, but usually it's just an hour or two where I'll respond myself personally to every question that's asked. So if you say, Jim, I, I use this technique and I got this response, what would you do in this situation? I will always answer all those questions. And then uh, we have built something that was really special because what we found was people are really good at kind of um, consuming content. They're good at edutainment. So they'll be edutained by a piece of, you know, coaching and they'll be like, that's a great idea, but then they never do anything with it. We wanted to solve that challenge. So this year we built video lesson challenges. So with our video lesson challenges, when people click, uh, they would watch a lesson, they complete it. Then they go to the video lesson challenge, which is uh, complimentary to that. We come down and we say, okay, you just watched that video lesson. Now here, what are you going to do with that information? How are you going to apply that in your market in real time? What are you going to do to actually um, use that so that you can be successful uh, in your marketplace? And what you do is we give you the lesson challenge. You say, hey, here's what I did with it. And uh, then you mark it as complete. And then you move on to the next lesson. Just that simple. So, you know, we've got lots and lots and lots of coaching, lots of downloads. Uh, here's 16 straight weeks of it. Um, but they cover all kinds of great topics. So I'm going to share with you. They cover sphere, open houses for sell by owner marketing, hot zone, which we call circle marketing and a demographic marketing, investors and builders expires, business to business, listing presentations. Uh, we go two weeks straight on listing presentations. We deliver a beautiful 17 page uh, state of the art PowerPoint presentation for you with a full script behind it and a whole series of follow ups uh, for your lead generation strategies. Then this year, we've just added as well uh, a marketing asset library. So with your marketing asset library, we partnered with Wilkerson Design Firm. And what they're delivering to us is digital marketing elements that you can use uh, in your market as social media uh, graphics and as printable materials. So just examples, fall gift tags, holiday recipe cards, breast cancer awareness graphics, Halloween marketing materials, 10 reasons to list your home during the winter, November recipe cards. These are all things that we've put out here over the last uh, few weeks and there's more coming out all the time. So we've just got them coming again and again and again. They're just happening constantly. We're putting things out, December recipe cards, uh, dream winter uh, vacation graphic we just put out. Um, so we're trying to keep you cutting edge and take the thought process out. So we're just making things easy for you. And then what we've done, uh, what's really exciting is we've added uh, a podcast library and we've added our webinar library. But the most uh, used aspect of our coaching is our uh, live coaching. So we have three live coaching segments we do every single week. So uh, you think about that, that's like 150 coaching sessions a year alone right there. Um, and they cover all kinds of topics I'm going to share with you. On Mondays, we do what's called our Monday Momentum, and that is live coaching with me, where I'm giving you the best ideas for 30 to 40 minutes um, on what I've learned in the past week from top producers from around the country, the best strategies, the best scripts, and here's an example. So this is me just giving you a lot of information. We have 50, 60, 70 people in the room at the same time, and we're all interacting. It's a lot of fun. And then right after that session, I deliver what's called the Monday Momentum Notes. So whatever I've talked about, I'm going to deliver the scripting for you. I'm going to deliver all my notes about how you can apply this in your market. So last week we were talking about estates. So we had a whole thing about estate sales here. Um, and that's a great part of the market. Another, another huge area of the market, which can be very helpful. Um, and then we do what's called our Wednesday workshops. So the Wednesday workshops are where we dive into a specific aspect of technology um, or marketing. So this week we talked about, um, we had Tiffany on here and we were talking about building a social 
uh, media group, a uh, closed Facebook group just for your sphere of influence. Great topic. We went really, really deep and really granular in it on all the way down to pushing which button and doing this and that and the other. But we have all kinds of um, deep dives into technology there. And then on Fridays, we do mastermind sessions with some of the top producers in the country where we interview them about what they're doing right in their market to create success. So if you'd like to jump into this, um, we're giving away uh, right now two weeks uh, free into our coaching platform because I want you to test drive it. I want you to make sure it's right for you. So we're giving you a free trial just to see if it's going to work for you. After that free trial, it's $147 uh, per month uh, and you can cancel any time for any reason. So we're making it super easy. I have to earn your business every single week. I th we think it's one of the most affordable coaching programs in the country and we're delivering massive value to you. I've got to earn your business every week. I'm not trapping you necessarily into some big contract because I can. I'm just giving you what you need and I'm earning your business every single week. I'd love to work with you on our Path Performance Coaching Platform. Please jump over, check it out, see what you think and click that button to do access the free trial. Just hop over to Eero State Coach and hit Explore Coaching to gain access to that. Have a fantastic day. Good selling, and we'll see you next time over at E-Real Estate Coach and The Path.